Hello everyone. Welcome to the inaugural International Network for Seed-Based Restoration webinar series. Um, I'm very greatly honoured to be presenting this first in what will become a great series of uh, opportunities for people to learn firsthand about how native seeds can be influenced and improved in restoration outcomes. The presentation that I'm giving is very much about work that I've been involved with for the last 25 years uh, and involves a tool that I believe is important for all people around the world uh, to be thinking about and it's the role of smoke and smoke products in improving germination and this is both for conservation and restoration activities. What I'm presenting is very much about the, the genie in the bottle um, and part of that magic that we've had with smoke is a wonderful journey with colleagues at the University of Western Australia, Murdoch University and Curtin University, which ultimately led to the discovery of the chemical in smoke. More of that in, in a little while. Smoke has been a mystery that has puzzled people for many centuries. We so often see burnt landscapes around the world, whether you're in the Californian Chaparral, the Mediterranean Basin, South Africa, or here in Southwest Western Australia. We see burnt landscapes and then following rainfall events, remarkable germination events. Research that people did for decades looked at the heat and the ash from the fire as probably the key agent. But then we found using those we could not, never get the sort of germination and uh, capabilities that you get when you see a post-fire landscape, such as you see in this image in the southwest of Western Australia. The bushland, the forest, the heathlands literally burst into colour with germinating seedlings coming up as a result of that fire. And those seeds, treated with heat or ash materials, indeed with a whole range of other products, including gibberellic acid, would often not respond. Here we see it more poignantly in this little 50 centimetre by 50 centimetre grid uh, that I've put over an area in the winter following a summer wildfire here in the Mediterranean zone of southwest Western Australia. This is remarkable because within that little quadrat, we, we have 65 seedlings, a remarkable number of species and 11 different plant families. And all of those seedlings that you can see there on the white sand are species that we could not germinate if we took the seed and, and sowed it under nursery conditions. So for us in this great journey, it has been trying to work out exactly what is the product that occurs from fire that is so important in stimulating a wide and diverse phylogenetic range of plant families. The benefit and use of this though spreads wide and far. Restoration is one thing, but we certainly know for the wildflower industry, and here we see wonderful images uh, from Eastern Australia of production of Western Australian wildflowers, but all of this production uh, relied upon vegetative propagation for a whole range of species because of deep, and what was considered at that stage, intractable seed dormancy. Now, fire produces a whole range of different products. Some of those products, We've now researched and found that, in fact, they don't have anything to do with germination. Ethylene is one of those. And the flowering that we see in many bulbs and geophytes around the world, including xanthoreas, um, which is an arborescent monocot. But if you're in the Mediterranean basin, many of the flowering bulbs there flower much more prolifically after a fire. But this little orchid that you see here, which has the, the name pyrorchis, the fire orchid, will stay completely vegetative for 30 to 40 years in some plots that we've had monitored, but the moment a fire comes through, the pulse of ethylene stimulates the flowering. But the mystery is, what stimulates this sort of flowering that you see? And this is in a nearby site to where you see those orchids flowering. These are a whole range of different plants. We have calendrinias in the portulacase, lobelias that are blue, and the wispy stems of a grass ostrostiper all of those have stayed in their deep sleep waiting for the fire passage and for an instruction to come through. Now the original discovery of the magic action of smoke from wildfires was work that was done by quite a remarkable botanist. He was a South African, uh, Johannes de Lange, 
He worked in uh, a number of institutions throughout South Africa, and between the period 1989 to 91, he worked on a little hillside like the one you see here near Cape Town for a very rare species, and that rare species was Udonia capitata. It was critically endangered down to the last few square metres of plants and in desperation to try and stimulate germination from what they thought was the dormant seed bank, he got a pair of big old blacksmith bellows, puffed some smoke out of a small drum onto the site and was able to stimulate remarkable germination. I was very privileged not long after that work to visit uh, the university and also the botanic gardens in Cape Town at Kirstenbosch and was shown these trays that you can see in that image, which had a range of ericas and beautiful South African restinaceae, all germinating as a result of smoke application. But what was interesting in visiting those trays is there was always a little bit of other germination happening as well in the control tray. But certainly it was one of those eureka moments where suddenly we thought maybe, just maybe, this was a solution not just to South African uh, germination post-fire, but for the Australian species and potentially for a whole lot of world species. Now, it's interesting that indigenous cultures globally, when we did the research, we found that indigenous cultures around the world actually had already come across smoke. For example, in Southeast Asia, they would put smoke through mango, mangrove, mango groves to improve flowering. We don't think that's to do with the magic germination chemical, but it was probably an ethylene response. But equally, corn was often put in the tops of small huts in Africa, in those smoky huts, and that the smoke seed actually germinated better. So clearly there was some indigenous understanding, but scientists, of course, were so clear that it had to be heat or ash. But of course, Johannes de Lange that you see here, and he's doctor doctor because in fact he's one of those rare people that did back-to-back -back PhDs. Remarkable man who, who then pulled apart the very great aspects of fire and of course discovered that it was the most obvious component of fire, the smoke. The thing we smell, the thing we see, the thing that sets off your smoke alarms is in fact contains the key elements that are important for germination of so many species. And as you can see in these uh, satellite images, whether you are in central Australia or bottom left, a major fire near Perth or these uh, raging Californian fires in the bottom right, smoke is a common and widespread product from all fires. So no wonder it potentially has the great action to stimulate germination. When a bushfire goes through or a wildfire goes through a site, and here you see an image in the top left of burnt bushland on the left, unburnt on the right. When you go into those sites and just using a little hearth brush that you see here and you sweep up the top five millimetres of soil, you will capture the magical element that's in smoke. By the same token, if you go into that burnt area on the left and you see in the bottom right a petri dish, and in the bottom of that petri dish is a piece of double-sided adhesive tape and all we've done is attach that to the top of the soil and pulled off layers literally soil grain by soil grain layers and we've done this for about 60 layers so it's given us about a five millimeter to six millimeter depth and what we've found is there's a point where we get remarkable germination because the smoke chemical is actually deposited in some of those subsoil layers and you can see that stimulation when we've laid on top of that layer of adhesive adhering soil particles, a piece of uh, filter paper, and then sprinkled seeds, in this case, of Eminanthe uh, pediguliflora, which is a species that is highly smoke re responsive uh, from North America. And you can see they germinate prolifically. The controls for soil taken from the right-hand side unburnt, of course, have zero germination, showing that the action is very much a product of that burning and combustion process. Equally, we've been into those same sort of burnt sites that you saw there, and they're sandy soils, so water percolates through, and we've measured the eluting of whatever the stimulating chemical in smoke is. And what we found, and here you can see here over a four to six week period at the beginning of our 
uh, southern winters here in the Mediterranean zone of southwestern Australia, following about two inches of rainfall, 50 millimetres, we find using a germination bioassay of the water coming through that soil, and we had little subsoil collectors collecting the soil, and then we would vacuum um, uh, collect those samples and then use those to soak seed, we found that the potent germination action washed through in those first few weeks, but was mostly gone after about 50 millimetres of rainfall. The top right image shows you a typical tray of white silica sand that we've put in a smoke shed where we pump smoke in. We'll show you in a moment how that happens. But you can see the brown tarry materials. Well, they're not actually the promoting compounds, but locked in them is the magic materials that will stimulate the germination. So what this shows is that clearly following a fire, there is a potent stimulant. The stimulant is temporal. It washes through into the soil seed bank and then passes out of the system, as you can see in later weeks. Now, the apparatus we use to make smoke is really quite simple. Anyone can do this. Be aware of your neighbours because it can be a little bit smoky and be aware, don't do this when you have total fire bans because the smoke might be seen as a, a, a fire. The drum that we use is a metal drum. You manufacture a simple lid. You can use any device that is fire resistant. The drum has a small inlet pipe to which we attach something uh, that will pump air in. In this case, we're using a small air pump that we've bought at the local camping store. This is the sort of one that you run from a cigarette lighter or a small car battery. We then attach an outlet pipe to the upper part of the drum. These are all made of metal and secured in place. And then we've put into that drum a range of combusting materials. In this case, we go, we're just using leafy material. A mixture of green and dry material uh, improves the smokiness that you've produced rather than just dry material. We avoid putting wood material. We certainly don't burn sawdust. And we avoid really oily plant materials. For example, eucalypt leaves can uh, cause uh, smoke production that contains a high, lot, uh, a high amount of um, oils that are in fact suppressive of germination. So once you've loaded in your materials and uh, they're sitting in there, you begin the combustion process, get that going a little bit. You then close up the drum, immediately turn on your small air pump. Air is pushed through the drum, goes through the outlet pipe, which helps to cool it a little. And once you've got a good flow of smoke, you can then do a number of things with the smoke that's coming out from that spout. The first is you can attach a flexible hose to that device and that flexible hose can then be attached to a range of drums. And in this case, using uh, drums in tandem, a small vacuum cleaner that you can see there on the right hand side, um, we're going to draw that smoky uh, material through water and there's a little inlet pipe that sits under each of the water films that you see here. And after a while, that smoke water will gradually darken and after one hour of percolating the smoke through, the, through that water, you will have produced smoke water. That smoke water can then be used to soak seeds. It can be stored for years or frozen for, uh, we've had for up to 15 years stored as frozen material, or you can use it to then uh, water onto your seed trays. Equally, you can take anything from a small camping tent. In this case, we like to use uh, at Kings Park, our, uh, our modified garden shed. Um, this, this garden shed, we have inside a range of trays. And in those trays, you can put either seedling trays with sown seeds, or preferably, you can lay out seeds. You then fill that uh, tent, uh, that, that uh, shed or tent structure with smoke. Again, leave the smoke coming into that tent for about an hour to ensure that all of those seeds and seed trays have a nice brown coating of the smoke-based material on them. Then open and ventilate the shed and remove your material to the nursery for subsequent watering and germination. Now, when you go through to the wild to try and understand what actually happens with the action of smoke, uh, you can find that often smoke application can perform better than actually the wildfire itself. 
Here you see one of the very early experiments that we did with, that we published in our uh, very early work back in 95, where we smoked sites for 30, 60 and 90 minutes. We then also smoked sand that we put on the site and we put smoke water on the site. And what we found was that 60 minutes smoke to a piece of bushland stimulated the maximum number of germinating seedlings. Adding too much smoke can actually be suppressive. So that's something to watch in terms of your applications. Equally, if you look down below the red and the blue graphs, you will see that we did this work in an adjacent wildfire site. So we had a summer wildfire. We then had unburnt areas nearby. We added our little smoke tent over the top of an area, smoked it for 60 minutes. And in fact, although we got the same range of genera and species coming up, we got a larger number of seedlings, showing that the smoke that we applied was more uniform and was able to penetrate more effectively and stimulate a greater part of the soil seed bank than what was probably the patchiness that happens during a wildfire. So the sorts of species that respond and the sort of action that you can get, we get a whole range of species which have an absolute obligate requirement. Here you see uh, Thysonotus, it's the fringed lily, but this can be a range of species from South Africa, California, the Mediterranean basin, the Chilean flora, or indeed even the European flora, where on the left you can sow seeds, water them, and nothing happens. On the right you can see the sort of germination that happens after about six weeks. Massive germination, eruption from the soil occurs as a result of the smoke application. And in this case, the tray on the right had been put into the smoke tent, and left for 60 minutes in a smoky environment and then uh, placed in the nursery for general propagation. Equally, what we've been able to do is to take smoke water, apply it over the top of topsoils for auditing of the soil seed bank. Equally, in some initial trials, we were able to get massive germination by adding uh, semi-commercial quantities of smoke water that we produced uh, that were sprayed on to replace topsoil to stimulate and promote more uniform germination, a whole range of native species. And this image on the right hand side is in the hyperdiverse Quangan shrublands uh, north of Perth, Western Australia. But there is a really large caveat. To do this effectively requires around 10 tonnes of smoke water per hectare. And that means the effective use of smoke on large scale applications, particularly for in situ stimulation of germination, would remain a very expensive and difficult process to do. Now, the sorts of species that respond in other ways can be seen here. And these are a whole range of Australian plants that you see from the flannel flower on the right to the kangaroo paw, um, sorry, kangaroo paw on the right, the flannel flower on the left. And you can see the sort of germination that you get. In many cases, you will get some germination in the top trays, in the controls, with the bottom trays getting more uniform, larger numbers, and a higher percentage of the viable seed germinating as a result. And the range of species is bewildering and complex, but it's a pervasive and general chemical that acts across all those species. This then summarises the way that we use smoke as a nursery conservation and restoration tool. Seeds can be sown and smoked in our smoke tent or smoke shed. We can make smoke water and soak seeds. They can be dried and stored for weeks to months to years, making sure those seeds are completely dry because that's important for storability. You can put seed trays in, as you see in the bottom left and right images. Seeds are sown, put into the smoke tent, and then carefully watered after they've had the smoke application. And using these techniques and a good mixture of green and dry leafy material, minimising the woody materials, we can get remarkable germination very effectively. So it's not complex to do. It takes a little bit of practice with new floras to calibrate the exposure times, but the actions are indeed very, very pronounced. We've taken this discovery and created our own small smoke kits. This is uh, 
for school children to understand a little bit of the natural mysteries that can be discovered through good science, trying to encourage more kids to go into universities and do PhDs in seed science, which will help all of us get, become better restoration ecologists. And here what we've done is we've taken smoke water, we've put it in that little vial that you can see there with the liquid. We have a small um, sauce pot that you see there uh, containing ger a germination medium, which is vermiculite in this case. And in the little gelatin capsule sitting on top of the little cylinder, there are the seeds of four different species that are illustrated below on the little packet um, that require smoke for germination. These uh, were sent to school so children could open the gelatin capsule, soak the seed in the smoky water that's already been pre-diluted to a 1 in 10 dilution, I should add. And then those seeds are sown into the moist vermiculite. The little lid is put back on the sauce pot. And then in about four to six weeks, the little seedlings emerge. These were a runaway success. So for any of you out there who want to get uh, an interesting educational package for schools, this is certainly a great thing too. However, the big discovery that we were hunting for, and indeed a number of research groups around the world, was trying to find what we call the needle in this haystack the chemicals in smoke responsible for germ germination. Casting your mind back, you'll remember that we said smoke water were required 10 tonnes per hectare. So if we we're ever going to get smoke as a more applicable broad acre tool, we were needing to find a better way and a more effective way. So if there was a chemical and we could synthesise it, is there a means that we can actually then bottle that chemical and be able to put it out on broad acre systems? The issue is, there's over 4,000 chemicals in smoke. It can range down to 2,500 depending on the type of material. The issue was how do you then work out which of those 4,000 chemicals with many of them being unidentified. Our approach was to look at a rapid germination bioassay species. And the bottom left image shows one of the great uh, uh, clues is the use of Grand Rapids lettuce. This is an old fashioned variety from the 40s and 50s, which has an insatiable appetite for smoke for germination. Indeed, it normally requires light, but we, we can replace that light requirement with smoke. This was the discovery uh, made by other researchers, which we then used this species as, as our rapid bioassay species. We then used two native species, a conostylus that you see in the middle, it's native to the southwest, and a trigger plant, a stylidium that you can see here, we use those as our native verification species so that we were certain that these post-fire germinating species were indeed the ones that were, that if we get to the chemical, it is the one that comes from fire. This is the apparatus with my colleagues, uh, Gavin Flamati, who led the work with uh, the late um, Professor Emilio Gizelberti and uh, Professor Rob Trengrove. Um, this is the device that was manufactured in the then chemistry department at the University of Western Australia. We had a smoke drum there. We burnt cellulose filter papers. In fact, we burnt a very large number of these. And so that's what we call CDS, so cellulose derived smoke. That was uh, put in that drum that you see on the right. We put a gas flame under it. We heated those filter papers so they began combusting. And then we drew through various chambers that you see on the far left through water, we essentially made cellulose smoke water. But what we discovered was indeed smoke water was only one part of where the chemical was. When we went back to what we have as the trap that you see in the center with the small con condensation tube attached, we found that we could find much higher levels of st stimulation, but we found a hundred times of that stimulation sitting on the tar residues halfway up the drum. So what we discovered was the drum was acting as a fractionation column. We were depositing parts of the smoke stimulating chemicals onto the sides of that drum. So what we did was we, we used that to scrape the material off and then use that material to do the analyses. Now what I'm presenting to you is an 11 year uh, study that we undertook. It was a very difficult uh, piece of work. The smoke that we used had about 4,020 chemicals in it. This is what's called a gas chromatograph mass spectrogram. 
Um, and it, all of those peaks that you see there indicate various chemical species in smoke. And there's an awful lot of them. And under each of the big peaks would be a whole lot of smaller peaks hidden. So our approach was, well, how do we then approach finding that chemical? We decided to use a different logical process where we went along and broke up that spectrum into different retention times. So going along at five to 10 minutes and taking off fractions, we then kept working on this, trying to locate which of the fractions had the most active material in it. After 11 years, we got down to just three peaks from all of those 4,020 different peaks that were sitting on that spectrum. There's three different molecules. We were then able to uh, analyze those molecules by both reference to chemical libraries. But what we discovered was that the number two peak was the one that had all of the remarkable germination stimulation action. And this is the molecule. It's the carotenolide molecule. It's particularly potent and active. It's a new molecule. It's called carotenolide to celebrate the Noongar word caric and olide because this is one of the butenolide group of chemicals. So caric is a Noongar word for smoke, very appropriate in this case. It's a molecule for which um, the research group has the um, patent for, being new to science, and it's turned out that it's an extremely interesting phytoreactive molecule. But the good news was, instead of our 10 tonnes per hectare, we discovered that we could get the same action in the uh, broadfield applications or comparing to wildfires of about one gram per hectare. That's less than a teaspoon to get the same effect as a hot wildfire in a hectare. So really, answering the question of the 10 tonnes per hectare, sure, took 11 years, but we now have a very much more effective tool. And the research is still continuing to refine the use of the field applications of that chemical, and it still has some way to go to, to be perfected under the applications. So back to the haystack, where was our secret molecule residing? Well, it was residing right down here. In fact, it's a tiny pimple on the side of one of the smallest peaks in the whole spectrum. So looking at all the large peaks was unlikely to have ever given it to you. It's actually quite a rare common chemical in smoke, but it's an extraordinarily phytoreactive molecule that essentially in a seed is operating at picogram levels. The sort of species that responded to uh, the carotenolide is referred to, and I've taken this from our first uh, published paper, um, uh, which came out in Science uh, with the discovery. It was called a butenolide then, but this is the carotenolide. We actually tested Australian, South African and North American species and a range of other species uh, that had been in the published smoke literature and found indeed uh, smoke water application compared to the butenolide, we got remarkable germination stimulation in those same species. So clearly this was the major master molecule that was the key to unlocking the mystery of bushfires from around the world. So we then found that this same responsiveness could be found in any of the countries where we had smoke responsive species. And consistently, we've found that this action is widespread and broad across a whole range of different species. For many species, we've found the carotenolide, as you see in this daisy species, re re replaces the requirement for light. That's why we were able to use the Grand Rapids lettuce seed so effectively in our germination assay. Equally, we've been able to do preliminary work and got extraordinarily exciting uh, results where, as you see on the top left, this is a control site. When we sprayed the site with our carotenolide in water suspension, we were able to stimulate the dormant seed bank. In this case, these are wild oaks, a vena fatua, uh, being stimulated to germinate. Indeed, when we buried weed, speeds, weed seed species in little envelopes that you see here, these little porous envelopes where the seed is sitting under the soil, you can see at uh, various levels of application of the carotenolide per mil, we can get stimulation from the soil seed bank. I've titled this the Holy Grail of Weed-Free Farming. 
because we've found about a third of Mediterranean-based agricultural weeds can be stimulated into what is referred to as suicidal germination, that is germination at depth where they can't emerge. Equally, those that do emerge could be easily uh, taken out with just a single application. This is uh, awaiting further research funding so that we can go to the next phase of looking at field applications of carotenolide uh, uh, for broadacre agriculture to try and look at this as one of the ways that we might get close to actually getting to the weed-free farming situation. So where does smoke reside? Well, this is the uh, phylogeny of the flowering plants on, the, on Earth. And indeed, we find smoke, as you see with the little red asterisks that are appearing, is phylogenetically independent. It occurs right across the flowering plants. And indeed, we have a whole range of gymnosperms that have dormant seed that are stimulated by the action of smoke. So it looks as though smoke is widespread phylogenetically. It has independent origins and has, been, uh, has evolved in multiple occasions throughout the angiosperms. So it's been strongly driven by ecological requirements of those species. Indeed, if we go back uh, uh, in recent geological history to the last two million years here in the southwestern Australia, uh, these are pollen, uh, pollen images taken from a sediment profile uh, deep within a, a stratum of rock. Uh, and each of the peaks il illustrate uh, the pollen deposition there is a particular family highlighted here. It's the Gyrus demonaceae. It is strictly uh, smoke requiring. And you can see if you look down right through that 60 to 70,000 year period, you can see the Gyrus demonaceae pollen um, ebbing and flowing, indicating that fires and smoke were stimulating those species all those mi millions of years ago. So what are the origins of smoke and smoke-mediated germination? We've looked at this, and when we started to get interesting responses in some of, the, uh, some of our rainforest species from Australia, we started to think that just maybe in the pre-combustible planet, when the planet was in fact uh, covered in rainforest, that just maybe the action of the carotenoid molecule might be related to something that happens in forests. And indeed, when you look at germination in many of the great forest species, they happen, as you see here, when there's what's called a wind throw, when a part of the forest falls over, uh, light, water, change temperatures occur, and you get a stimulation of germination just where that tree fell over. What we've been able to do is to show not the presence of the molecule, but that we do get preferential germination wherever we get this physical disturbance of the organic material that's been lying in the sort of state of uh, biological equilibrium on the forest floor. What we're saying is, as you see here, this uh, fire break that was pushed through and then left to regenerate, that physical disturbance and agitation of the organic material in equilibrium in the soil seems to release a smoke-like action that equates to fire. And we can get similar species with similar growth responses happening without fire through the physical disturbance of soil. And we believe that what happens when you disrupt the organic equilibrium, that you get essentially what's called microbial fire, where you get an exuberance of microbial activity. It's the principle of the fellow farm paddock. And that following that period, there is a release of the chemical adjacent to seeds, which then stimulates the germination. And in many respects, this is why farmers, when they till fields, probably get much more enhanced germination in a range of species. We're getting proximal release of the carotenoid molecule near those weed seeds. This is research that's ongoing, and hopefully we'll be able to soon uh, locate the molecule uh, at these uh, very fine scales in these soils. So in summary, smoke is a remarkable tool that everyone can and should use. It is a tool that gives remarkable results from the soil seed bank, so it can be used as an auditing tool. This is for ecological research, and the image you see in the background is us auditing the soil seed bank to understand longevity and spatial arrangements of seed banks in this biodiverse Quangren community north of Perth. Equally, 
There are a large number of genera. We've now got to over 100 genera and more than 2,000 species globally that respond to smoke. Importantly, with work that we're doing through our partners in the NASTEC Alliance, smoke has been shown to stimulate a range of species from Europe, including things as common as familiar as heather in Scotland respond to smoke, indicating that the action of smoke is independent of whether the environment is fire prone or not, we get species from tropical to subtropical environments also responding where it's a disturbance phenomenon. Importantly, if you're using smoke, I encourage you to generate your own smoke or even talk collaboratively if you're a community group to say, let's get a little smoke area going, create our own smoke water. Smoke water that's often commercially available is produced from wood smoke and that contains a range of substances that can be potentially suppressive to germination. So I encourage you to think about combusting your own leafy material and using your own local material for germination. So thank you all for this journey back in time and into the future, I hope, for the role of smoke in germination. This has been brought to you by the International Network for Seed-Based Restoration, and uh, I acknowledge my colleagues and support of Curtin University and Kings Park and Botanic Gardens. Thank you so much. This presentation was brought to you by the INSR, the International Network for Seed-Based Restoration. To learn more about the organisation, log on to the website and go to the info section where you can learn how to become an active member of this global network.